Hello and welcome to Open Access Week and today's seminar. We will start in about a minute, uh, but first uh, let me introduce myself, Johanna Melinda. I work at Linköping University Library and my colleague Kauri. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kauri Hoshirashan and I am a bibliometrician at uh, Linköping University Library. Yes, and we will talk to you about open data from several different perspectives. But before we start, uh, you have the opportunity to ask us questions in the Q&A, and we will answer your questions afterwards. So let me start. Open data from data management to repository. And first of all, open data is one part of open science. science open science is sometimes regarded as an umbrella concept, which includes open access, which you heard about in the webinar Tuesday, for example, open source, scientific communication, open educational resources, citizen science, and also open data. So that is one way of looking on open science. The other one is to try to imagine the future where the science is actually open and everything we could do if knowledge were more accessible to all and all research, which would be more transparent and could uh, foster innovation and education in a simpler manner. But today's focus is open data. And there's a lot of focus on open data and data management today. We find a lot of discussion from policy uh, in the Swedish governmental bill, Forskning's proposition, it is discussed on EU level. There is a specific cloud called EOSC. Even UNESCO has a written declaration on open data. But also other reasons uh, makes us discuss it even more. There is a different view on rules and regulations today as compared to 10 or 15 years ago. Suffice to say GDPR and most researchers know the different demands that are put on us nowadays. There is a grassroots movement on open science. Uh, people who believe in uh, the idea of open science, but also that data is perceived as valuable and has become a commodity. So the same movements as we see on Facebook where data on us is more valuable, we also see that the data produced as scientists becomes more valuable. The demand on researchers on research data comes from several different actors. It comes from political demands, a governmental bill, the EU, which I discussed before. And this is channeled to the funders, which also puts pressure or expectations upon us when it comes to research data and also through the higher educational institutions. This is one type of pressures, but the other one comes from academic journals who ask us for data availability statements or uh, similar uh, nowadays in the way they used to do. So in order to start opening our data, we need to do some groundwork before. And this groundwork we can call data management. And it's a cornerstone for data, because if we, we're we not managing our data well, the value of the data will be diminished. So what is then uh, data management and good data management? It could be described as a checklist. And the first point is you should be aware of rules and regulations affecting your project and know how to follow those rules and regulations. You need to have uh, necessary permits, permissions and consents. You need to have necessary contracts signed. Yeah, uh, we sent out a questionnaire to NYU researchers about sharing research data. And when we ask them what kind of help they want to when sharing research data, and there was an answer about the conflict uh, that say support from the legal department when discussing and signing data sharing contracts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kauri. 
you need to know the information class for your project. So you know how to keep it safe, how safe you need to keep it. And if you know your information class, you can also see what kind of software you're allowed to use, software which is deemed uh, safe enough to use with your data, and also what kind of storage solution you need for your data. You need to keep order on your research data. And all involved in the same project should follow the same order because otherwise it's very difficult to find which versions are correct, what has happened to different files. You need to document the choices you have been making so you can see the difference between different files and also reuse them. That way you can also trace back the conclusions you have drawn, for example. So this is a rather difficult list. Yeah, and uh, now I want to introduce one more answers from the um, questionnaire. And uh, uh, we asked uh, what is the most burdensome aspect of sharing research data? And the, uh, the answer was uh, writing understandable readme files so that the other may actually make use of the data. So uh, it, it is a very important to proper, uh, properly document method, assuming that you will uh, uh, write um, understandable readme file later. Thank you. So you can see these are rather many things you need to master in order to manage your data and in the end, if you want to open up your data. And thankfully, there is a tool which can help you with this, and it's called a data management plan. We have at LIU developed a, a tool called DMP Create, which helps you to make such a data management plan. And the link is put here, and you need to have an LIU ID to write this plan. So if you're not from LIU, you need to find someone who can help you see what it looks like. We have open workshops every three weeks in how to use this. So if you're not sure on how to fill this in, you can get some online support and can help you answer your questions and also discuss the finer points. In this DMP Create, we have made suggestions for answers adopted to Ellen when at all possible. So you don't have to look for the answers uh, yourself, but we help you when we can. And we have also made it into suggestions rather than essays. And here is one practical example. Wetenskapsrådet, the research council, in their core requirements on what should be in a, in a data management plan, they say you should write about documentation and data quality. So, for example, they're asking you uh, for the associated metadata relating to structure, standards, and format. And what we did was see what is the most basic metadata that you need. And then we put this into rather simple things. So here uh, you get to choose a subject from a drop down list, for example. And also the second part of that question documentation, data quality, asked about how data quality will be safeguarded and documented. And here we have asked researchers at our university how they look upon the quality of research data. And we come with a number, is it eight different suggestions on how you can uh, verify the quality of the data. And then you have other also, so your opinion. And that means that you have a basis for discussing quality of research data and you don't have to invent the wheel, basically. So moving on from data management to open data, where do you find open data? Well, the landscape is a bit different from that of publications, for example. So I have made a very simple sketch to outline what it may look like. Uh, research data is often found in repositories. And these repositories are either general or subject specific. But you can also find open data in not proper repositories. Uh, they are not organized the same way as a repository. And the most important of them is GitHub, which Kauri will talk more about later. The interesting thing is each repository 
has a metadata standard and a metadata catalog. So they structure information about the data sets in different manners. And then we have search engines. We have basically two very important search engines. And they are looking into those metadata catalogs to help you find the research data. And the most important of, that, of those are Google. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. Kauri would talk about that soon. So now you've got an inkling of what the open data landscape may look like. So, Karin. Yes, um, um, before I talk about how to find research data, I want to mention a little about the FAIR principles. Um, Should I move forward? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the FAIR principle stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and it's principle that describes the appropriate way to publish open data. As Johanna told you, research data is spread around many parts of the internet. And it is important to follow the FAIR principle to make the data sets more findable and uh, reusable. So um, how can we find research data we want to reuse? Uh, and uh, here is a um, flowchart uh, that show how to find research data. And, uh, the first step is to check the relevant paper has a data availability statement. The data availability statement show where the data is available. And uh, um, yes. uh, here is an example of data availability statement um, of uh, a paper in Nature and Communication. And it may look a, a little different depending on the journal. But in this case, there is a data availability and the code availability. And the, uh, you can just click the link and go to the repository and just download the data. Uh, even if there is no uh, data availability statement, you can always try to contact the authors for the data set. Uh, but, um, can you click one? Yes. Mm. Um, uh, if the relevant uh, paper does not have a data availability statement, you can search research data with a data set search engine. Uh, then first you can uh, narrow down the subject and refine keywords. Then first you can search the keyword if it is the Google data set search. Uh, there you will get a wide range of data. Uh, then Next step is to do the same thing with uh, data site commons. With data site commons, you can only search for data that have uh, DOEs from uh, specific agencies, and you will get more specific results than with Google data set search. So, uh, and when you find relevant research data, Check if it meets your needs, uh, for example, license, uh, for file format, and uh, reusability. But if you still cannot find anything, search for subject-specific uh, repository on an open science tool called Registry Data, uh, the Registry of Research Data Repository. Registry Data is a register of our 3,000 uh, research data repository worldwide and covering all scientific disciplines. So you can search for relevant repository by entering one or more keywords, or you can also search by subject or type of content. Research data display basic information about the repository. When you find a repository that seems relevant, uh, you go to the repository and search for the data, uh, data sets there. And if you find a relevant data set, you can check if it meets your needs. Uh, yes, next. Um, and now I will talk about uh, LIU researchers' data sharing. We asked uh, uh, LIU researchers who have deposited their research data in repositories uh, why they share research data. 
And here is the result. Uh, almost half of the researchers say that uh, because it was important to share research data, and the rest say it was required by publishers, founders, or within the project. Okay. And before sending the questionnaire, we investigated how many data sets with LIU affiliation are found through the data set uh, search engine, data site commons. Data set and uh, data site commons, as I mentioned before, uh, only retrieves research data with DOIs from DOI agencies, cluster found data sites. We also limited the data type uh, to um, data set. Then we sent the questionnaire about the research data to LIU researcher we found in the investigation. Uh, so now let's see if we match the result of the investigation on the result of the questionnaire. Yes, um, here is a result of uh, the investigation where LIU researchers deposit the data set. Uh, Figshare has the largest number of DOIs followed by Zenodo and uh, Dryad. The reason for the much higher number of DOIs uh, on uh, Figshare can be due to the number of factors. The first possible factor is uh, that um, Figshare platform is used by several uh, publishers. LIU's um, dataset were actually deposited at five different publishers, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis, plus uh, Future Science Group and the Site Life Lab. Uh, publishers a uh, figure share platform often uh, archive supplementary materials such as diagram and their uh, tables. And uh, often several DOEs are provided for the supplemental uh, materials of a single article. In one case that we found uh, was 17 DOIs were assigned to the supplementary materials of a single article. Uh, and Fixture also assigned a new DOI for every version. This factor may be the main reason for the large number of DOI in Fixture. And uh, Yes, and, and the Zenodo. <laughs> Zenodo has the second highest number of the DOIs, but uh, Zenodo has a partner with GitHub. Uh, GitHub is a popular platform uh, for code. And uh, because GitHub uh, does not give DOIs, so if you want to uh, DOI for code or dataset on GitHub, you can get it from Zenodo. The investigation did not include code or software, but it is possible that the Zenodo's integration with GitHub may have increased its popularity. Yeah. Uh, in contrast, uh, a dataset in Dryad has only one DOI. Even if you update the dataset in Dryad and the, the version changed, the DOI remains uh, the same as the latest version and the latest version will be available for download. And Dryad collaborates with Zenodo since uh, 2019. And if there is code or supplement like uh, material such as table and figures in the article, uh, they are published in Zenodo. Uh, in other words, in uh, only raw data is available in Dryad, while other data may be available in Zenodo. This may be also affected the Nodos uh, number of DOIs. Uh, but it should be noted that the number of DOI is not necessarily the same as the number of uh, studies. Yes, now let's recap the result from the questionnaire. Uh, 32 people responded to the questionnaire. And the nodal was used the most, followed by GitHub, Figshare, and uh, Diva. Regarding the general repository, the nodal, Figshare, Dryad were popular, same other in the investigation. Regarding to the subject-specific repository, GitHub was the most popular subject-specific uh, depository. 
And we could find more subject specific repository in, in this survey than the investigation with data site commons. The reason for this is that the subject repository do not provide DOI to data sets. They often have their own patient identifier than DOIs, and it makes us difficult to find the data set. So it's also important to consider if the repository provides DOI when you choose repository to share your data. Yes, uh, and uh, in the questionnaire, we ask them what made the researcher where to share their data. And uh, here is a result. Some of the common motives include requirements and the recommendation from publishers and journals, simplicity and ease of use, free of charge, and the possibility of long-term uh, storage and reuse. While there are some common motives, motive, it is important to note that the choice of research data repository may vary depending on the researcher's um, specific subject area or uh, collaboration or individual preferences. And uh, it's in, in, implied that there is no universal best platform that suits all research, all research projects. Instead, researchers must consider various factors, including journal requirements, collaborators, technical needs, and uh, available resources to make an um, informed decision. Yeah, uh, here uh, the, some additional takeaway from the survey. Uh, a, a very interesting thing from this survey was that uh, several researchers did not aware that data sets were were in the repository. A possible reason for this is that the publisher, not a researcher, has deposited the supplementary material for the article in the picture. Uh, another possible reason is that a particular person in the research group is responsible for the data set and the other are not involved in the sharing of data set. Uh, and we found uh, it is necessary to use several different uh, repositories in some cases. For example, um, raw data in Drive Dryer and the other data in Zenodo. Finally, the DOI is uh, very important to the findability of the data set and important when you choose repository to share your data. Yes. Um, so far, we have looked on open science, what open science is. We have discussed what open data is and where to find it. We have discussed the merits of data management and writing data management. We have looked into finding research data, and this has proved to be a rather difficult endeavor. Uh, according to some numbers, uh, less than 2% of all research data today is openly available, which is very, very far from the Swedish goal that in a couple of years, all officially financed data should be openly available. So uh, if you're a researcher and if you want to start putting your data online, where should you put your data? The main point here is that since data is hard to find, uh, make sure to put it where it can be found. And we are trying to sketching on, to make a sketch of what you might want to consider when you are making your data openly available on a repository. So the first question is whether or not there is a well-known subject-specific repository in your academic field. In some fields, such as biology, for example, it's very, uh, there are some very specific repositories which are used and which researchers in the area are using a lot. If there is such a specific subject-specific repository, make sure to use it. Uh, next thing or item to consider is looking upon the demands the publisher has on where you should put your 
your data. If we're looking at large publishers, uh, most of them have lists of recommended repositories. Not all, uh, very few tell us that you need to put in a specific repository. But if they demand that you use a specific repository, uh, you should, of course, do that. One very important thing from the investigation we made when we compared where Linköping University researchers, according to the mapping and put research data, when we compared that to the questionnaire, we found that although we have worked a lot on finding Linköping University researchers' data, it was very difficult to find it unless there was the uh, OI, that is a permanent link to the data. So if you want to put your data in a repository and you do not offer a DOI, think carefully whether or not you want to put it, because usually you need to invest a lot of time to make data openly available. It vastly improves findability and also interoperationability. There's a connection between publications and data, for example. One important thing is the question of sensitive data. We have seen that the demands of putting data online comes from different actors, uh, and sometimes there is a need to make data open which are sensitive, and then, of course, you can't do that because it's against the law. Then there are solutions to put sensitive data away from the researcher but still in a manner that not everyone can access it. So if your data includes sensitive data, you must be very, very careful on how to, uh, how to make put that into a repository. There is a very simple uh, rule for what you can put on a repository, and that is that it should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. And when it comes to sensitive data, the way to move about is finding a repository which includes sensitive data. Also, in some areas, it is custom to put your data on a repository when uh, you're accepted, uh, your article is accepted, and there is only a peer review link to your data. So it's not openly available, but it's available to people uh, which need to peer review your article and your data. So some repositories offer such a peer review link, while others don't. So here is the sketch we have made on some general repositories. These are not subject-specific repositories, but general repositories, and what they offer and don't offer. Sonodo is actually a very good repository. It's non-commercial and uh, it uh, has a peer review function. You can't put sensitive data there, but you can have a peer review link. It's free of charge and uh, you can put very many different file types and many types of information, not only what could be considered data. Data in itself is a difficult concept because it could be raw data and it could be supplementary information, it could be tables, etc. But Synodo is a bit wider. Next, uh, Dryad. It comes with a cost. Sometimes the publisher will cover this cost, but it's a very good repository, but it only agrees on raw data. That's why they're in cooperation with Synodo. So we have found in the uh, questionnaire Cowdy has made that many researchers, they choose bouquet combining Driad and Synodo, for example. Open Science Framework uh, is a very interesting uh, repository. It's more than a repository, you could say. Uh, it also has other functions. Uh, Harvard Dataverse, uh, uh, does not agree on sensitive data. You can put have peer review uh, functions there, and it also is wider than only raw data. DIVA, that's our institutional repository, could be used as a repository of last resort. 
So if you have needs for putting things uh, in a repository as data, we may also uh, may often be able to help you. And if you need peer review function, talk to us first so we can discuss what's possible to do. A uh, newcomer here is LIU Secure Repository. We have a very little repository where we can help you store sensitive data. So if the publisher had asked you to put your sensitive data in a repository, you can contact us and we will help you sort this out. So no one who shouldn't have access to the data will have access to the data in case it's needed. Lastly, a very widely used repository, which is very much more than a data repository, is Figshare. It's a commercial agent and it's used by many publishers. And here you can find everything from PowerPoint slides to data. So think carefully before you put your valuable research data there and see if there is a better, more suitable repository for your information. Good. So, and lastly, one very important thing is you need to register your data set in Diva. Or you don't need to, but you could actually benefit from doing so because then your data sets will be available uh, in the same location as the list of publications. So people can see not only what you have published, but also which data sets you have published. And published data sets are possible to cite and can also give you merit in your future career. So thank you for your attention. I will stop. Thank you.